My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We have before us today a story most curious. Well, it is one of the most familiar stories from the Gospel of John, the tale of Jesus changing water into wine at the wedding of Cana has bewildered biblical scholars and theologians for centuries. Although Jesus' miraculous act at the wedding has been long held as the first of seven signs of Jesus' divinity in the Gospel of John, the full meaning and purpose of the story is unclear. Further complicating matters, Jesus comes across the story as, well, aloof, arrogant, and downright cruel to his mother. In fact, I think my own mother would slap me across the face if I responded to her with, woman, <laughs> I mean, good Lord. In fact, any woman should slap me across the face if I said that. <laughs> It is, however, one of the many occasions in the Gospels by which we get to know Jesus for who he is. And we might be a little troubled. What sort of son speaks to his mother as he does? And why doesn't he call her by name? As I contemplated the story this week, I found myself drawn not to Jesus, but to his mother. Well, I know the story ultimately reveals the glory of Jesus and the glory of God with its many subtle and not so subtle hints. I actually think the story is about his mother. And she is not named, which makes me further think that his mother is representative of all of us. Mary comes to Jesus in her hour of need, in a moment of great anxiety, and places all her hopes and trust in him. Even though he fails to respond to that, she persists and does not waver in her conviction that her son will make right a troubling situation. The story, so it seems to me, is the story about us and our commitment in the investment of Jesus. Now before I say more, let me share an observation I've made over the years of lay and ordained ministry. I've been serving in the church for about 25 years and my own experience and journey of faith. I often hear people say that they find church and the life of faith dull and mundane. Many will come to church hoping to be wowed and awed by their experience, only to be left numbed and less certain than when they first walked into the door. Now it might strike you as utterly bizarre that I'm saying this, but I think this is something that we need to talk about. I'll be the first to admit that I've, in, I've endured countless liturgies that have left me un, uninspired. I even f have fallen asleep in a sermon or two, not with Stephen, but I've fallen asleep. <laughs> Once, actually, while well, in seminary, at a Roman Catholic seminary, I fell into such a deep trance during the sermon that when I heard the priest say, through Jesus Christ our Lord, I jumped up from my bench and yelled, Amen, only to discover that he was still preaching and the rest of the congregation was still sitting, turning around looking at me and thinking, what had gotten into you? We're not Baptists, we're Catholics. You don't yell, Amen, during a service. Troubled by my behavior during the liturgy and frustrated that I seemed to not get anything out of it, I went to my spiritual director, a very wise and old priest, for some advice. He patiently listened to my laments as to how boring and bland I thought the liturgies and sermons were. After I bore all my sorrows and disappointments, the priest sat in silence for some time until he asked me a question. 
What do you bring to Mass? Puzzled by the priest's words, I, I asked him what he meant. He observed that the, during the whole time that I complained about how bad church was, that I never said anything about what I gave to the liturgy or what I invested in the liturgy. My lament simply reflected my expectation that one went to church to be awed, wild, and inspired without any cost or effort on my behalf. I came to church in the same way that a consumer would go to a store or a restaurant expecting to get the best service possible without doing anything, without expecting anything. He then said something to me that has remained with me ever since. If you want to get anything out of liturgy, you have to be willing to offer all you have and place it before God during the offertory. He further elaborated that liturgy isn't simply a one-way relationship, but a rather a relationship we have with God and the church, a relationship in which we invest ourselves into this time. We will only get out of the liturgy as much as we're willing to give in. If we want our hearts and souls to be deeply moved, then we ought to lay them bare, fully and completely, before God. We ought to come to the liturgy not asking what we will get out of it, but what we will give and be open to Jesus' response. For reasons unknown to me, the priest's words left an indelible mark upon me and radically changed how I approached church and her worship. I realized I wasn't coming to church to be entertained, but to enter into a deep and abiding relationship with the living God and his body, the church. But to experience that, I had to be willing to give something of myself and to be open to where that relationship would lead me. And this is what Jesus' mother does. She comes to Jesus in her hour of need. While we do not know for whom the wedding banquet is, or for who it was, we can gather that it must have been a closely related family member to Jesus and his mother. Some scholars have argued, although with little evidence actually, that it was a wedding of one of Jesus' siblings. It is clear, however, that Jesus' mother was deeply worried and concerned about the embarrassment caused by running out of wine. Now this is a historical fact which, unfortunately in our culture, we don't necessarily get, but it's important to note in this story. In the Middle East, hospitality is a virtue par excellence, both in the ancient world and our common time. One must offer their very best hospitality at all times to anyone who comes into their home. To run out of wine would have been the most embarrassing thing and perhaps even considered socially offensive at this wedding. Thus Mary approaches Jesus. She pleads with him to help. She places before him all her concerns and fears. And despite Jesus' rebuke, she persists. Her tenacity reveals she knew something about Jesus that the disciples and other guests do not. Jesus has yet to have done any wondrous works or has even entered fully into his ministry. Mind you, this is very early in the Gospel of John. We know nothing about him other than John's wonderful philosophy that he is a word made flesh. But there's nothing about his story at this point. But she knows him. She believes in him. So she places all her hope and trust in him 
and sets before him her fears, anxieties, trusting that Jesus will do something about it. And he does. Much to our surprise, Jesus not only brings about new wine, he gives it to the people in abundance. Now get this. Oh, I would have loved to have been at this wedding, by the way. <laughs> My gosh, if I had this much wine at home, I wouldn't know what to do. By some estimates, they say the jars likely would have contained anywhere from 120 gallons to 160 gallons of wine. My gosh, that's a party. That's practically the entire LCBO right there at this party. <laughs> Moreover, the wine was the finest wine, held by the most expensive jars in the land. The abundance of wine, very fine wine, symbolized the abundance and joy God promises, not only to Israel, but to all of God's people. Jesus' transformation of water into wine echoed the prophet Amos's foretelling that the mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. Other clues we read in the story today further emphasize the restoration of God's people and the new life given to them. Recall the banquet takes place on the third day. That's a detail that Cameron read at first. On the third day. This detail evokes for us, the readers of John's Gospel, the resurrection. For that took place on the third day. Furthermore, wedding banquets symbolize the future day when all shall sit down at the table of the Lord and enjoy a great feast. All. This is the key. All shall sit down at the table of God and enjoy a table of plenty. Thus, this, this story not only about offering God offering all his people abundance and joy, but the promise of new life when all sorrow and suffering shall be no more. Mary's insistence that Jesus must give new wine reflects her deep belief that he is the one who shall come and save his people. She knew in that time God will provide for God's people and Mary allowed herself to be vulnerable, to place before Jesus all her fears and anxieties and trust that he would do something. She becomes for us a model of faith. She doesn't simply wait for Jesus to surprise her or to awe her or to astound her, but rather places herself entirely into his care, confident that he will do something about it. And so it is with us. We can't simply come to church and stand before God and accept, expect something miraculous to happen without some sacrifice on our own part. We, like Mary, have to be entirely vulnerable and place all our fears and concerns into the hands of God. Moreover, we must be willing to give something of ourselves to our worship. We do not stand here to be entertained and amused, but to enter into a deep and abiding relationship with God and God's people. Like all relationships, we have to be willing to invest time and energy into it by spending time with God and opening our hearts to Him and sharing ourselves with the community of believers. If you want to get something out of church, if you want to get something out of your life of faith, you're going to have to be willing to invest time and energy to prayer, to study, to regular worship, and be vulnerable and lay yourself bare before God, trusting that God will care for you. And not according to your expectations and plans, but totally trusting that in time, God will breathe new life into you. 
Believe me, if you do, you will grow into your relationship with God and God's people in a way that your life will be utterly transformed. I can tell you that from my own experience, to be honest, (laughs) although I've been rejected and wounded by the church, the institutional church, I should say, I've experienced such profound love in my relationship with God and God's people. In fact, it's the reason why I'm standing here, to be honest. I could have very well left the church many years ago, but I did not, because I knew God. I knew God was a God of love and grace. But for that to be possible, I've had to make sacrifices, invest time into my relationship with God, to get up each day and place myself into the hands of Almighty God, trusting God will give me new and abundant life in ways I can hardly imagine. So I ask you, (laughs) will you join me and give of yourselves and place all your fears, anxieties, hopes, and dreams and place them into the hands of God? Will you join with me in investing your time and energy, and I mean this, really investing your time and energy into life in relationship with God and God's people? Will you be open to miracles as Mary was so, was so long ago? Then let us walk with this journey, confident that God's loving providence is always with us. Amen.